Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Games for Change as a resource presentation. So we have a few people with us, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started uh, real quick to uh, say a special shout-out to those that have made this event possible. So first off, the uh, Metagame Book Club. So this is an open book club that you guys might be familiar with. Uh, many of the panelists here, actually I think like all of them, have uh, been involved in the book club in one way or the other. Uh, this is something that we use. Remember, we use the hashtag uh, Metagame, uh, and we use it. We use Twitter. We use social media. We also use Google Plus. And we've covered quite a number of books. Uh, and we actually are going to have have one a little talk about it a little bit later. We actually have one coming up for the summer. So. Fear not. Also, uh, this is brought to you by the Games and Simulations Network from ISTE. And it was not possible without the help of the inevitable instructors, as always. So it's kind of fun playing around with two computers here. So I apologize for looking down. So uh, first thing we have here is we have a uh, overview. So we're going to kick off with a look at a, a summit recap of the Games for Learning. Then we're going to talk about the 2014 Games for Change winner, Gone Home, and we're going to talk about the this, this year's winner, Never Alone, and then we're going to talk about Twine, and then we're going to wrap things up with Games for Change and the Effective Domain. So it should be lots of fun. So our panelists are Marie, you guys can feel free to wave or say hi, John Spike, hello, myself, Chris Lukes, hello, Sherry Jones, Kay Novak, and Leanne. Uh, and sorry, my camera doesn't seem to be working, so I'll just say hello to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and stare intently into the camera. Yeah, with a smile on my face. <laughs> yes, yes, with a smile on your face, definitely. <laughs> so uh, before we get started, we're going to turn over things over to Kay for uh, a quick, uh, quick discussion. Well, it's more like an app overview. Uh, the whole impetus for us going ahead and doing and doing this um, hangout was really the Games for Change. Now, Games for Change is a festival that happened in New York City. Um, you might know Tribeca already, and it was associated. But at the same point in time, there was a Games for Change festival, and I'm going to try and put this a little more full screen. And I'm on their website right now. And their website now is www, and it's gamesforchange.org. So go ahead and take a look. And what you're going to want to be looking at, really, is their games. So if you go on their site, what, what they do is they have 133 games listed. And these games are meant to make social impact. So it's a bit different than our games for entertainment. Um, a bit different than our serious games or even, even you know, our epistemic games. These are the ones that are trying to change people's opinions, their thoughts, their beliefs, and really, and really their actions. And as you can see, there's a lot of different categories. And I invite you to go and play there and, and see what works for you. Now, I know some of us, I know, I know Sherry has taken some of these games and put them into the classroom. I know Chris has. I've been in classrooms that we've used them before also and that we've gone here to, to really look at games and seeing which ones would be usable for us. So what I'm going to say now is um, I'm going to turn it over to Marie because these three day, this three-day event that happened um, in in New York City last month. The first day, or I should say the pre-conference, was actually the Games for Change Summit. And Marie, uh, Games for Learning Summit. And Marie was lucky enough to go, and we'd like to her to tell us about it. OK, well, thanks, Kay. So um, yeah, I was like incredibly lucky that I had the chance to go to the Games for Learning Summit. Uh, this was sponsored by, among others, the United States Department of Education. And what, I, what was really kind of compelling about that is that um, the more mainstream nature now of thinking about gaming as, uh, as, as, uh, as something that has a, not only a place in the classroom, but a place in lifelong, life-wide learning, which is 
uh, different approach, and it's one that um, I think those of us who've been involved in gaming for some time believe in pretty strongly. Uh, Chris, are you able to show show the slides for us? Is that a possibility? Because if so, could we go to the next one? Thanks. So my Twitter hashtag there, the Games for Learning Twitter hashtag there, which is important because uh, if you want to get kind of a feel of what people were talking about, what was going on at the time, uh, aside from the live stream, the Twitter hashtag is kind of like the back channel information that we got to see. And I'm not, what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to go through in any detail what everybody talked about and summarize that because those videos are available and I encourage you to go take a look at them. But I am going to talk about some of the themes. So if we can go to the next slide. Some of the things that were interesting that people talked about was why gaming. And one of the key things was this notion of learning humanely. This idea that um, this kind of decontextualized, uh, test-based uh, learning factories that we see in uh, schools these days is not humane that it's more robotic and automated than actually working with machines can be. And so we talked about how using gaming, and especially gaming with other people within a community, brings more humanity back to the classroom than, um, you know, than, than a lot of curriculum does. Another interesting notion along those lines was people were talking about whether or not games can be a force for equity. Are games a, a way that we can actually reach the most disengaged among us? And if we can, uh, does that make it a much more powerful lever than um, perhaps some of the other ones that, 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 that we're currently pushing? One of the best parts about this conference was that it wasn't just people who are advocating for gaming and education. There were game developers, there were academics, it was a real cross-section of folks, a lot of cross-pollination. One of the tracks talked a lot about how do we make gaming become something that is um, uh, economically feasible. From, from a societal point of view, from a, a, a national point of view. And so there was a lot of discussion about what are the ecosystem challenges. And there, you know, it's the usual suspects. People talked about uh, how hard it is to sell into a fragmented uh, market, how difficult it is to sell uh, when the end users are not the customers. Um, people also talked about the challenges that are coming up legislatively with uh, new privacy laws, new privacy legislation that sometimes, though it may be well-intentioned, uh, ends up having a very chilling effect on innovation as it suggests things such as uh, it is now illegal to take student data out of your state. And clearly, cloud-based solutions involve student data being hosted out of state. That's, uh, that's the name of the game. And then there was this other theme that talked about, you know, what is the perception of gaming versus the perception of schooling? How difficult it is uh, for many folks to um, think about gaming as something that belongs in the classroom or something that is a legitimate way to learn. It's almost as though, um, for many people, you have you have two um, two. Uh, um, structures, two mental structures that prevent that shift in perception. And the, the first one is the way I did it is the only way it can be done. And the second one, sadly enough, is no pain, no gain, right? If, if it isn't painful, if it isn't difficult, then you're not doing it right. Uh, and I, th I think everyone who assembled there was, uh, was there to challenge uh, th that kind of a perception. So let's go to the next. Uh, slide, I want to talk about some of the takeaways. And actually, the takeaways are all from the same keynote. I don't know if you guys have seen Rafrance Davis speak, um, but she was just real, right? She wasn't there to talk about you know, some academic theory about gaming. She wasn't there to talk about you know, uh, ecosystem rationalization. She, wasn't, she was there to talk about teaching and learning and her experiences and herself as a, uh, as a fangirl and a gamer girl. Um, and she talked about two games, among others. She talked about Rocksmith, which is um, uh, 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 allows you to actually learn to play guitar for real using gaming types mechanics in a software in a software program. And what surprised me 
is how surprising that was to everyone in the room. So we've assembled all these folks who are gaming advocates, who see the potential and the beauty, and yet, when we talk about, well, let's use a software program, people use a software program to actually learn something, it almost feels as though that's revolutionary. And I think that kind of takes us back to the no pain, no gain theme. It's, it's, as, it's as though hard work doesn't count if you're not suffering while, while, while you're doing it. Well, it's like, the, it's like the old adage, you know, it's not good for you unless it tastes bad. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> My medicine is, you know, two oranges for scurvy. Well, anyway, so she also talked about Assassin's Creed and just what an interest that game has created for people who are um, in history who love to play the game. And so they talk about students who get interested in little historical facts through the game and then go off and do all of this other research and how it's a, a gateway drug, if you will, to authentic history, not to uh, decontextualized um, facts and, uh, and dates and events. If we go to the next slide, I actually wrote up a wish list. These are the things that I would like to see the next time we convene a group of folks as uh, deep, experienced, and thoughtful as this group. And the first one is, I want to level up. This audience is an expert audience. Everyone who's there is, uh, has a, already has a great deal of depth and thought about gaming and education. And I think that to some degree, a lot of what we did was we just kind of talked to each other and telling each other the things that we kind of already knew. Now, some, some of the speakers said these things brilliantly. Uh, speakers were admittedly from different segments, and so there was a kind of level setting that had to happen. We had to talk, if you're an educator, we have to talk about the ecosystem. If you are a business developer, we have to talk about the classroom. So that makes sense, but I still feel that um, with the expertise and experience that were at that, uh, organiz at, at that convening, that it's possible to take it up a level and to actually talk about things that are more challenging, a little bit harder, assuming that we already have a little bit of context. The next thing I would love to do is let's make it multiplayer. There were, as usual, we had um, breakout sessions, and those were you know, engaging. It's not as though we all just sat there and did sit and get, we, we got involved, we did things. But I feel as we could engage in more thoughtful problem solving. So rather than being engaged in these sessions to understand something new, maybe we could be engaged in these sessions to create something new. The next thing I'd love to do is gear up. So I, I, I am a gamer. I do play World of Warcraft. And I care desperately about the quality of my gear. And I suspect that everyone who came to that event had some awesome gear that they could actually duplicate and share with all the rest of us. So I'm talking, of course, about tools and, and resources. But even more importantly, I'm talking about frameworks and perspectives and the surprising and the counterintuitive and the things that are just not so clearly known and so obvious. And in fact, when it comes to presentations, I've been trying to analyze what is it that makes some presentations just so awesome, you know, aside from dynamic speakers. And I think it's different for different people, but for me, what I love more than anything is the kind of presentation that my co-panelist Sherry Jones will, <laughs> will provide because I like things that are academic, grounded in research, things that are not just um, purely theoretical. I like things that are surprising. And they can be surprising in a couple of different ways. One is they can be counterintuitive. And that's something that happens fairly frequently when it comes to um, education. Or it can be something that is just surprising to me. It, maybe it's a new area that I'm not terribly familiar with yet, and just getting uh, a basic grounding in that is outstanding. Or maybe it's something that I just didn't know and that actually surprised me and that I would never have thought of. We ha if we can go to the next slide, we had some of those conversations. One of the, my favorite, favorite breakout was from Glass Labs. And they did a couple of great things. First of all, they talked um, in a very uh, thoughtful way about how does assessment make sense in gaming. And we, keep, we talk about how we want to be able to assess through gaming, 
But that's a, that's a very difficult nut to crack. That is not a trivial problem. It's not just collect all the data and suddenly you know things. I mean, that's, I mean, that's level one. Okay, it is a level. <laughs> but it's not end game content by any stretch of the imagination. And so not only did they talk carefully about the analogs between assessment strategies and, and, and uh, in-game strategies, they also talked through this game that they created, and the game is to help students become proficient in argumentation, which is all good and well. It's a game. But then they went into the details of how they structured that game, how they created the game, what kinds of elements were a part of that. And it ended up being just beautiful, geeky, brain candy uh, kinds of input and information, and I enjoyed that tremendously. I also had the opportunity to have some hallway conversations with the, uh, the founder of BrainQuake. These guys do Was It Trouble, which is one of my favorite math games. I like it because it's a puzzler. You play it as a puzzle. You play it because you like to play the game. And then as a side effect, and they, they, apparently that day they were just like two days before releasing uh, new research, um, but apparently the students learn a tremendous amount of skills. And so some of them are clearly in math, but they're also, but we could also ask the question, if you're learning critical thinking, higher order thinking skills that you know, clearly apply through math, and they showed great, uh, great gains in, in kids' math, and they had a control group, right? So they just had the same teacher. Uh, some kids got to play 10 minutes a day, some kids didn't. The ones who got to play 10 minutes a day improved dramatically compared to the, to the ones who didn't. So very interesting, interesting stuff there. And I had a follow-up conversation later. I said, well, what is it about assessment? What is it about collecting and analyzing and understanding this data? And the answer was, it's not about data collection. It's about design. Can you design your game in such a way that it forces uh, students or players to really engage in rich mathematics, in thoughtful mathematics, in non-symbolic mathematics? And if so, can you create a user experience where the digital interface to that is better than a real world experience? And if you do, then you have something that is a profound uh, and real math game. And then once you have that design, it's pretty straightforward to collect the data from that to be able to see what kinds of strategies and understanding standings the players are, are coming to. And eventually, you can get to the point where you can look at big data. Oh, and by the way, these guys are completely anonymized. They never know who you are when they look at your data. Uh, but you could, they, uh, they can look at, they could eventually, someday, theoretically, look at big data and say, well, you know, the kids who approach it X tend to end up Y. And so you start being able to get clues that say, how do we go in deep and really understand what it is about hovering over this one part of the screen for 20 seconds before you go on. What's going on in your mind there? What, what is it about that that is indicative of something that is, that is correlated to better outcomes and results? So um, that's really all that I wanted to talk about. Um, but I absolutely um, want to uh, encourage anyone to go back, take a look at the presentations, take a look at the discussions, and, uh, and if, we, if, if, if um, the summit isn't the only place where these conversations and this work can, can happen, and so let's you know, level up. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Marie, so much. Um, and, and we are going to look at this again. And I just love your piece. I'm going to come and edit exactly what you said and put it out on Games for Learning, and I'm going to tweet it out. Uh, it was You gave us a very thoughtful view of this all. And, and Games for Change do, does a lot of different things. And, and one of the things that they do is each year they get a list of games, and they take nominations about games that have social impact. And John Spike is here um, because he was teaching with last year's winner for Games for Change, and he's going to tell us about it. Yeah, thank you so much, Kay, and uh, thank you, Marie, for um, that recap of the um, Games for Learning Summit. Uh, a lot of what you talked about, I think, really lends itself nicely to why I think Gone Home was selected as a winner last year, and I'll talk a little bit about um, my experiences uh, co-teaching it with another teacher 
um, during the uh, school year. And we're actually, I'm super excited. We're going to be teaching it in about a week, so I am beyond excited to get back in the classroom with this game. A little bit about Gone Home. Um, I think what makes it such a unique experience and such a powerful game uh, is that it is kind of does a really good job of adding that storytelling element to um, game-based learning and something that uh, really lends itself nicely to students analyzing it as a literary piece. Um, I grew up playing uh, games like Earthbound and Chrono Trigger, and I didn't actually, the funny part was I didn't actually play these. I actually watched my brother play these games, and I think that speaks to how powerful the story was. I wasn't so much engaged in the gameplay as I was engaged in watching these characters come alive and, and watching these stories unfold. So I was actually watching the game almost like it was a literary piece. And that's kind of how we've approached uh, Gone Home, is we've approached it as a literary piece, and I think that's why it, it was a Games for Change winner, is because there, there hasn't been something like this where it is truly driven by story and not so much driven by the gameplay plus story. So um, take a look at the next slide uh, for Gone Home. A couple things just to get you an idea if you've never played Gone Home before. Um, it's a first-person exploration game. So when you first load up this game, um, I know a lot of the students when we first played it, you know, were expecting that the, to arm themselves with weapons or something and to enter this mysterious house, um, you know, and, and expect zombies to come out at them. But uh, actually, you uh, play the role of Caitlin Greenbrier, and you've been um, abroad for a year, and your family in the meantime has moved to a new house. Um, this house kind of feels weird, mysterious, kind of has a, a supernatural element to it. Um, but basically what happens is you learn what's happened in the family since um, you went abroad. So you're in the role of Caitlin exploring this house um, as a stranger. So it's kind of a unique way that Fulbright set up this gameplay experience. Um, it's non-traditional gameplay in that um, really your goal is to discover the storyline. Uh, so while the storyline oftentimes is kind of the window dressing to the action and the gameplay, uh, here the gameplay is driven of you need to figure out where to go next, what to experience next, and the best part is you can actually experience this story um, in different ways as you play the game. I had some students who didn't explore entire parts of the house because that wasn't the path that the story led them on. That wasn't where they decided to go. So the, the story didn't force them to go anywhere. There are some places you have to go to to experience the story, but um, it was interesting because it's almost like a novel that you could read, but you chose where to go in the novel. Not so much a choose-your-own-adventure, but... We're all ending up in the same place, but how are you going to choose to get there with what your character finds valuable? Now, how you learn the story is through a variety of ways. Um, you discover objects, and you can pick up and examine objects. If you remember back to the picture that I had on my last slide, uh, Chris, you don't actually have to go back for it, but um, there was this picture of this postcard that Katie, uh, Caitlin picks up in the story. You can pick up, I should say. And you get a little bit of even your character and who you are based on the artifacts in this um, in this game. So it, it was a great opportunity to teach ideas like symbolism, how symbols represent certain characters. Um, and that's something I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, you know, we had uh, Marie talk about how do we assess games, and one of the things we did was assess some of these objects and, and take that um, to the next level. And um, oftentimes the best next level in a game is what will we do uh, and apply from this game in our own lives. So we'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, the other big thing too is it's an experience rather than competition in Gone Home. So instead of us fighting for a high score or um, you know, trying to defeat uh, mobs or monsters, uh, we're trying to take everything in, really. Uh, so there's a lot of, actually, argumentation out there about whether this is truly a game. Um, I would argue that it is, um, but maybe my definition of a game is different than someone else's. So just big recap is you're exploring a house, you're taking in these artifacts, you're taking in story storyline. It's told through journals of a character that you uh, meet along the way, your sister, actually and other artifacts and other pieces and rooms of the house that you discover. So a lot of different ways you, you pull in this story. And Games for Change, I think, really highlighted this game again because um, we haven't seen too many games like this that are truly driven by this narrative. There are some games that had a great narrative, but this one is narrative-driven. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next uh, slide, Chris. Uh, one thing that um, I that really stuck with me, I'm a big Roger Ebert fan. I don't know if uh, anybody else was a Roger Ebert fan, if anybody in the chat wants to raise their hand or not. Or if you're not, that's okay. But um, I, I just love that he was he was not so much a film critic as he was a life and culture critic. And one thing that stuck with me, I loved his reviews. I you know, sometimes disagreed with him, but one thing that he got in a lot of controversy over was he said, games will never be art. 
And this quote, uh, he wrote a blog, he had this blog, um, and one of the blogs he wrote about this was, uh, he had this statement, he said, let me just say that no video gamer now living will survive long enough to experience the medium as an art form. And that always stuck with me because I had such a respect for uh, Roger Ebert, and I still do. Um, but uh, I think this is one of those ones where if he had had the chance to see Gone Home, unfortunately I believe he passed in 2011, 2010. I'm, I'm trying to remember the date off the top of my head. But, um, you know, he didn't see games like uh, Gone Home that, you know, were driven so much by the characters and, and driven so much by your experience and what you take away from the story. Um, and also the fact that the story had a lot of thematic elements going on too. Um, I, think, I think he would have maybe regretted this statement a bit. And I think this was a game that really would have spoken to him as an art form. So um, just, just a piece that, that always stuck with me. I truly feel like Gone Home uh, is a Games for Change, and one of the reasons that uh, Games for Change identified it too is because it truly, um, it's an art form. It's something that moves you. I had an emotional connection to it. I've read a lot of reviews on Steam about this game and a lot of um, tears at the end of this game. And we've, we've, I, I'm sure we've had games before that have made us feel this way, but... Um, I think uh, this one really encapsulated quite well um, because it is an art form. Uh, there's something about learning about a person through the objects in their lives and um, these intimate journal entries that we get. Um, it's just a kind of in interesting, interesting argument that I think he'd regret now that he's seeing games. But even so, I believe there are games that I would argue uh, were art even when Roger Ebert was alive. One of the ones I would say is Chrono Trigger that I grew up with. So um, just, just my take on it. Um, I guess we go to the next slide too. Uh, yes. So um, one of the things too, um, if you want to advance it too, I think there's some text that should pop up on there. Um, one of the things we looked at, talking about uh, Marie mentioned analysis and how do we assess what students learn um, when you take a look at a game as a text. So what was the author of the game trying to get across to you, or what do you, what purpose do you think they had, or um, how do we look at the storyline of a game or the the purpose of a game even. Um, there was a question we tried to answer this year when we used Gone Home was, could it be read and analyzed like a short story or a novel? And I was inspired to do this. i got to give a shout-out to Paul Darvasi, who is a big game-based learning enthusiast, and his Ludic Learning uh, blog really inspired me to try this. Um, so um, with, with kind of some of the ideas that he had in mind, um, we moved forward, and we tried to read this story as, uh, or excuse me, this game as a story. Um, you can go ahead and move to the next slide, Chris. And apparently it's going to pop back up again. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so one of the ways we approached assessment was we treated this game much like you'd treat a text. So uh, one of the things we tried uh, was we'd actually have the students annotate. And they annotated in a couple different ways. One way they did was through screenshotting. So just like you make a note in the margins of your text, um, I as a former English teacher, this was right up my wheelhouse, of course. But um, you know, much like we annotate the sidebar of a text with a, this 3D space, how do we capture that? Um, we actually took screenshots um, and had students reflect based on the screenshots they had in a Google document or um, whatever you know document you're using for uh, your particular classroom. And I think this could be done in a lot of games. Moments that stick with you, hitting that pause button and being able to freeze frame that moment and reflect on that moment I think is valuable. Um, and that's one of the tools we use. We also use screencasting. Uh, whether it was QuickTime on a Mac or Screencastify, Screencast-O-Matic, um, to also uh, have the students actually walk through the experience of the game and talk about um, what they were experiencing, so to verbalize kind of their thoughts and feelings about different parts of the game. Now, this is easier in a game where you don't have uh, monsters coming at you. Uh, this might be a little trickier, but we've also done this in games like Minecraft as well, um, Papers, Please, um, games where students have that moment to kind of reflect on important decisions they made, or symbolic objects or themes that they were picking up. Uh, so we had that annotate and reflect piece um, that, that we found really valuable. Um, we go ahead into the next slide. Another note while we're uh, switching slides on that too. Um, one of the things that stuck with me from the James G talk um, that we had a few months ago um, is that he mentioned that the next level should be real life. And I think that's true in Gone Home. I was asking myself, well, what is what is what's the next stage of this in real life? And it was kind of reflecting back, I think, for our students. We had them reflect back. What, what artifact would people find and get to know you in your life? What is significant to you and what's, what tells your story? Um, and so that's one thing that uh, we kind of used as an extension was uh, what, is, you know, what, what do we have that symbolizes us and, and what themes can we pull away from the story and apply to our own life? 
Um, just taking a look at this uh, last slide that I have too, um, we also mentioned uh, things that are grounded in research. And this is the most elementary of research possible, so please don't print this or use this as, or cite this in any publication. Um, <laughs> I just want to say that out, loud, uh, out there because we have one <laughs> class, one class, um, you know, give their responses. We're going to have a second class give responses too. Um, so this was just uh, some thing, two, two pieces. I had about a 15-question survey for the students. And one thing that they mentioned is they found Gone Home actually – um, 10 out of the you know 23 students, once again, very rudimentary research, uh, said that this was actually easier to analyze, they found, going through and, and pulling up these items um, than a traditional short story novel or film that they had read in the, in the class before. Uh, two said it was harder, and then we had 11 who said about on par. So um, I think it speaks to the product that Fulbright Games put out um, and that uh, Steve Gaynor and his team made. Uh, and Steve Gaynor really said he wanted this to be almost like a, a play-like experience. Um, so almost like a, a performance that you lived and you were a part of, interacted with. So um, I think that led itself nicely being analyzed. And once again, Games for Change, I think, ref understood that and, and definitely selected it for that reason. And then uh, I, always, I thought this was just a fun one to add to the conversation that we're having today is um, what do students think about video games? And um, you can see there, you know, 11, 47%, 11, small sampling size, of course, said, they could potentially have a place in education if done correctly. And uh, I think that's uh, an interesting point. And uh, nobody said they should be a large part of education, which also struck me. Now, granted, I didn't have too many hardcore gamers in this group. I had probably uh, probably three or four hardcore gamers. Um, some heavy gamers were probably another third. And then a lot of very rarely or little quick games on the phone. So kind of interesting there. But... Yeah, I think you're right, Chris. They want to keep their games and education separate. Separation of uh, school and game uh, will be a landmark uh, Supreme Court case, I'm sure, someday. Um, I see uh, Leanne asked, um, what do you think of the quality of their analysis? Um, oh, yeah, um, for what grade level it was, um, this was uh, actually seniors in an elective writing course. Uh, so uh, I, I was pretty pleased with the level of analysis. Uh, we did mostly character analysis of uh, what you determined and what you made of the characters based on what you found about them. Um, we did have some students analyze um, the scene, uh, the, the, the setting of the story. We had some character or, uh, students, I should say, analyze uh, themes going on. Um, those were the big, big focuses. But the analysis was pretty on par from what I had seen. Uh, so they said it seemed easier to do, um, but I, I thought I saw pretty much a, a, a pretty spot-on um, transference uh, between those concepts of theme, symbol, um, characterization that we, we've seen in other mediums. So I think between film, literature, and video game, they were actually able to distinguish uh, and, and make that transference of knowledge. Uh, so th that was the, the big things I had on Gone Home. Um, I'm going to try some new things uh, with the, the new iteration of it, and I'm excited to see what we do. But I, I can't stress enough, if you want to learn more about the implementation of it, um, we have some resources that are included, I know, that we're going to be pushing out to the metagame group and, and out on social media. And uh, Paul Darvasi's blog is one that I included in there. Um, I included a blog post I put in, um, but I, I, I would point you to Paul's because he, he really fleshed out the whole process of, of his Gone Home experience, and it's very valuable. So, um, yeah, I, I just uh, can't stress enough uh, how much I, I think this is a great shift we're seeing in games, games that are... Um, as Kay will talk about, effective games and games that, that elicit an emotional response um, out of the end user and, and make us kind of examine uh, our life in relation to what's happening in this one, which uh, I think is pretty powerful. So I appreciate the time, and, and my apologies to the future presenters. I actually have to step out, but um, uh, I look forward to watching the, the rest of the cast. So thank you. No worries, John. Thank you. So the uh, the next one up is uh, actually me. I'm going to go ahead and uh, talk about this year's award winner, Never Alone. So it's uh, kind of an interesting uh, uh, game in itself. So uh, so what is Never Alone? Uh, I am not going to try to pronounce that, uh, but uh, basically what it is is it is a collaboration between Upper One Games and uh, Native Alaskans. And really what the, this game's main purpose is, is to tell uh, a traditional lore of the Inupat Inu people. And so uh, it's really a, a, an interesting thing. It is on, it is on the... Available.
is available on Steam and a few other places. Uh, it's interesting that they define themselves as a world game. And what they mean by that is that it's a game that draws from cultures to create complex and fascinating game worlds for a global audience. And so you sort of get an idea uh, of what it is, is laid around. And of course, it's available on lots of different things. Uh, the version I played was in Steam. And really, it is a, it's a one-player game, or you can also co-play as well. So you, it can be a one- or two-player game. And the main characters are Nuna, who is an Inupat girl, or you can play the aptly named Fox, who is a fox. <laughs> So you can see him sort of trailing back here. So uh, the interesting thing about it is, you, is you play single player, you have to toggle between the two, the two players. So it adds a little bit of extra complexity to the game and the fact that you have to be managing both of the, both of the guys uh, at the same time. So uh, play style-wise, it's a lot like Mario Brothers. Uh, what I mean by that is that you move left, right, up, and down. And it's a platformer game. So in other words, you, you do a lot of jumping from platform to platform to platform. And if you fall off, yes, apparently there's lots of uh, never-ending crevices and black holes and everything else in, in the Arctic that you have to, do, you have to worry about. Uh, so <laughs> there's lots of stuff there. Uh, what's interesting about it, though, is the progress in the game is to actually unlock videos to watch. And these are all mini documentary pieces that were shot of the actual uh, Elder Council and various uh, Inupat individuals who were telling the story and telling about the culture and giving you background. And so that's the interesting piece of this gameplay. Um, so we'll go ahead and I'm going to show a really quick video down at the bottom so to give you a feel for it. And then I'll go ahead and try to launch the game and see if it works. So uh, I just went ahead and flipped forward. So one of the things that's unique about it is you saw a little bit of the scrimshaw art here, and they incorporated some of that scrimshaw into the actual game itself. And so you get these narrative passages that you see these beautifully uh, rendered uh, scrimshaw art as you, as you go through it. It's been animated as well. And so there's the fox, and there's Nuna. And so this is what I mean by it's a platform game. So you're running from platform to platform, you're trying not to get squished or get blown off. Ah, you're avoiding uh, various uh, tricksters and different lore. You have the very bad person there. He likes to throw fireballs at you. Dramatic jump there, and yes, you do slow motion jump. You have polar bears. You're climbing ice. It's falling. And so this is sort of what you, you see as you play through the game. You have a lot of cliffhangers, a lot of grabbing onto things, just by your fingernails. So they do a very good job of the pacing of everything. So really, uh, the takeaway for me was, as I played the game, I really found myself really sort of looking to unlock that video. And to see the different videos and, and see the different pieces uh, that were going ahead and being provided uh, for me. Uh, and again, when you start off, you get two videos to get you hooked, and then the rest you have to unlock. And so you have to find them. And so they basically have these little owls that you have to watch out for. And they're sort of stuck in like little Easter egg places. So you have to, you have to really be aware of what you're doing. So not only do you have to worry about everything that's trying to catch you, polar bears, and uh, other things, you also have to look for these little owls so, that makes you, so you can try to get all the videos that are out there. So I found it as a very interactive way to explore it beyond just the normal, uh, the normal mythology and folklore the way it's normally presented in a, in a text format. So this is really interesting um, that they actually incorporated a lot of the oral cultural tradition of the Inupats, where traditionally this is, this is a history is passed down through an oral tradition of storytelling with scrimshawing and other things. So they, they incorporated all those elements to give you a, a really nice uh, game. Uh, what's other interesting that, that, that you take getting used to for those that are gamers is actually the girl and the fox do not level. They start off at the highest level they're ever going to achieve. And, uh, you know, there is one, one part maybe you can say is a leveling piece that happens to the fox. But I don't want to give it away because it's a really sad thing that happens. But then you, you sort of get over it and 
uh, it, it, the fox comes back. So um, there's some different things that that you uh, you experience throughout the game that that really does engage you on multiple levels. Uh, again, no experience. You're not getting any XP. You're not getting any gold. Uh, basically, your focus is survival, uh, and also you have knowledge. Is the other is the other dri main driver of this this game is that you're driving. You're driven to learn more about the Inupat culture and more about this specific uh, lore, uh, this, uh, lore tale, folk tale that they're telling. You do have to listen for the owls. Like I said, they hoot at you every once in a while uh, to sort of get your attention when you get close to them. So there's an audio cue uh, to try to break you uh, from all the different sliding around and jumping around uh, that you have to play around with. Uh, and the other thing about this is what's interesting about this is, is that you can't kill anything in this game. Uh, your, your, except for yourself, I guess. Uh, you can kill yourself quite a bit, but uh, uh, or the environment can kill you. Uh, but really, as a, as the, as either the fox or the, or as Nuna, you really do not have anything other than a bolo, and a bolo does not do any damage to anything other than you know ice. It breaks ice. Woohoo! Uh, but the thing is, is that uh, like that polar bear that they showed, eh, you can't drive off the polar bear with a bolo. Doesn't work. Uh, it just makes it angrier. Uh, so, <laughs> so there's some different things that you can go ahead and and do, but almost everything you're doing is it's all about avoiding these dangers, trying to stay ahead of the dangers. Uh, you really don't have any ability to sort of stop the danger or drive the danger away. It's always a constant thing. And you do a really good job with the with the music and the the ambience to really sort of give you that. Okay, now you're you're facing a life or death situation. You need to run. You need to move fast. And so the gameplay is pretty slick. You move at different speeds as well, so like you'll hit different inclines, and there'll be ice, so your character will just slide on. And if you don't time the jump right, you go flying out, and you land on your face. And it takes you a bit longer to get back up, and and whatever's chasing you can catch up to you. So um, the other thing I noticed is that once you've gotten through, you've played through the entire game, uh, you can actually go back and pick different chapters. So if you missed a video, or if you like a specific sequence, uh, and you wanted to go do it again, you didn't have to play through the whole game. Uh, to get back to that. There are save points uh, along there as well, but uh, but primarily that was the interesting thing I thought was that you can actually go back and pick which chapter uh, you want to uh, uh, basically progress on. So how did I do? Well, I got 21 of 24 unlocked. Um, so uh, the videos are out there uh, on the web. People have already captured them. Uh, interesting. I don't know if they're copyrighted or not, but they are out there on people's uh, you know channels. Uh, YouTube channels, so uh, you can also get to them that way as well. But uh, what is interesting is is that it was something that had you play. Uh, I think roughly it took me uh, about probably eight to ten hours uh, to play through the whole game. So it is it is a lot of content. A lot of that was due to the fact that uh, it is a puzzle game as well. Like you'll get locked in the bear den, or you'll get locked in different places, and you have to figure out what mechanic you need to figure. You know, you need to figure out what you need to do. Um, to get out of the bear den or get out of the different places. Uh, YouTube is a great place to find out how other people have done it. Uh, so you can go ahead and do some second screening there as well. Uh, the only annoying thing I had really for the game was that um, whenever you, uh, tr you can't really use your mouse. Your mouse allows you to throw the bolo, but like if you wanted to click off of it to another screen uh, or pull something else up on the computer, your computer is pretty much stuck in the game, and it uses your keyboard, so it's a very good keyboard trainer for all of you uh, who don't use your 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 WASD or your WASD keys. Uh, that is really sort of how you move around in this game, and uh, your mouse is basically just there to throw to, to aim your bolo every once in a while. And uh, so so a lot of it is just sort of jumping around and, and you know spacebar for jump. So we all know spacebar is jump. So uh, there's different things that you can you can play around with the game, but uh, very fun game. It is about 15 bucks uh, though, and uh, but it does play pretty quickly, and uh, I found it rewarding. Uh, I'll probably go back and try to get those last three videos uh, just so the next time I can go like, look, I got 24, 24. Uh, but again, no 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 expertise, no experience other than what I learned, and uh, no gold, no no leveling up. It's a uh, one-off game. Uh, but uh, I have noticed that as I go back, and as I, even when watching other people's play style, I'm actually seeing different things. Uh, I think it really does give you a good look at the harshness of the environment uh, that that the Inupat people live in, and it also uh, shows their 
their traditions and their culture. Uh, it does a really good job of highlighting that. So uh, definitely encourage people to try to check it out, whether you're watching it via video or uh, if you actually go ahead and uh, support them by purchasing their game and, uh, and playing it. So, so next up, up we have Sherry. Hey, thanks, Chris. And that was that was a good presentation. I think I might try to to play that game just to experience it without going to YouTube first. <laughs> so I am going to present on Twine. Um, this was a session uh, during the Games for Change um, conference, um, and one of the session is that we have three presenters talking about the impact uh, and also uh, issues surrounding Twine. So if you can go next. Okay, so really quickly, um, Twine is an interactive fiction authoring tool. Uh, particularly, you know, it's used for creating the nonlinear branching narratives, and you're using those to to do a form of storytelling. Um, and I didn't mean to have that word cut off there, but essentially, right now, a lot of developers are using Twine to create games that don't really fall under what commercial or conventional version of what games are. Um, so they make some uh, innovative stuff through Twine. Okay, so I think we can go next. All right. So. I'm going to go over some of the arguments that the speaker has presented, and I will reflect on some of those arguments uh, according to my own practices with using Twine in my classroom. Uh, but one of the arguments is that Twine helps advocate communities. Okay, so uh, the general uh, consensus is marginalized individuals are using Twine for self-expression and for connecting with others and forming communities. Now, Naomi Clark, who is also a teacher. She teaches game design, so that her interest primarily with using Twine is she wants to introduce Twine to women in minorities and STEM fields. And I think we we most of us know that in STEM fields there's not a lot of women, and minorities are starting to, uh, you know, starting to form in those communities. But she wants to use Twine to invite more <laughs> women and minority into STEM. Um, and also, interestingly, she also pointed out that Twine is for sharing and the co-construction of new knowledge. So, in the sense that when you make a Twine game and you share with your uh, fellow members, you are sharing knowledge as well. So she's interested in Twine in that sense. So we can go next. Okay. Now, there's also a problem with game labels, and this is what Maricopa um, pointed out. And Maricopa is a um, game designer. And I think in the video she said that she made 12, I think 12 games uh, using Twine. But she has a problem particularly with Twine games that are being labeled as empathy games or queer games. And she made this game called Empathy Machine, which is actually a challenge of this idea that uh, you can actually... Well, let, let's define empathy, right? In the traditional sense that empathy is the idea that you are you are able to connect through that person's experience by living in their shoes, if you will, okay? But Maricopa is challenging this idea, which is can you actually really live in someone else's shoes? You're not that person. So all you are really experiencing is trying to understand that person, but you can't really be in their shoes. So she made this entire game challenging this idea of calling games as empathy machines, okay? And she wanted to, uh, also uh, a point that she made is that we really need to respect that games, or what we call empathy games or queer games, are really forms of self-expression. So next. Okay, so here's another big thing from uh, the session, which is the idea about Twine as an accessible tool. So most of us think of Twine, as, at least uh, for us who have used Twine. Um, Twine is fairly easy technically, so if you're not a programmer or you don't understand programming in an advanced stage, um, Twine is not as intimidating because you don't really need to know programming to use Twine. But this idea, and let me go over what they said first. <laughs> so Austin Walker said that uh, often heard Twine allows platform for marginalized voices. However, the impact of Twine is not just for Twine consumers, but for Twine developers. So for Twine consumers, they get to play these innovative games that doesn't fit in the traditional sense. And also for Twine developers, well, 
what does a developer do? They create games. But if you open up this kind of tool for the mass, you know, mass consumer, many consumers can become developers themselves. That's why it's revolutionizing. Um, also, he says that Twine allows people to create a safe space where they can create games that do not fit anywhere else. This idea of safety, right? And we've heard lots of controversy without referencing exactly what the controversy is regarding what exactly is a game and what should games contain. But in this community using Twine, you can pretty much address anything you want and it's a safe space because you have a supportive community, you know, rallying uh, around you. Maricopa says that Twine, and oops, that got cut off a little bit, but he says, or she says, that uh, Twine blurred consumer-developer dichotomy, so that boundary is more permeable. So that means that consumer-developer, that bifurcation between those two identities is starting to get blurred because Twine is so easy to use. Thank you. And go next. Thank you. So, on accessibility. So I framed this as thoughts about accessibility. And what they are talking about, though, is when we are saying accessibility, is it really enough just to call something accessible because it is technologically easy to use? So there are three major complaints by the three speakers, okay? So Nona Clark uh, points out that, um, first of all, when she's teaching students using Twine, she is asking them, what exactly are skills that are important to have before one can actually get started on Twine? And she is basically referencing not just technical skills, but the idea of how to design a story. Because storytelling is not just creating branches, and it's not just creating options or choices, but there's a whole art behind how to make stories. Okay? She also asked, what kind of skill does a novice or student need to know right, or understand before they can make something good? So this concept of good, that's a whole other conversation, which is what exactly is a good twine and what exactly is a bad twine. So she wants to open up that conversation about accessibility there. So if we can go next. Okay. Now, Maricopa, she says that, well, here's an obvious point that most of us didn't think about, but I, I'm glad that Maricopa brought this out. She says that majority of twine games are written in English, so obviously if you don't read English, you, you can't play the twine games. So... She believes that in order for us to make the game even more accessible, we really need to open it up uh, beyond language barriers. So there should be translations or uh, invite other speakers to start making Twine games. So if we can go next. Okay, thank you. Austin Walker brought out, and I really love his, his uh, arguments here because he's from the humanities side, okay? So there are other concerns that we're thinking about, which is um, this is a humanities, you know, professors thinking, right? So what are the conditions in which I've been pushed through to make this tool good for me? So all of us, we have certain conditions. So conditions are, are taught to us either through people we associate with, through our childhood, and so forth. So these conditions allow us to do certain things in the world. So he's asking us to say, wait, we need to ask, what exactly are those conditions that makes things easy for me? Second is, what are, are those conditions available for other people? So if it's available for me, are those same conditions available for other people? And if they're not, what are the conditions that are not available? And lastly is the conditions of reception. So reception is how we receive the text and how we judge as good or bad. So he brought out another conversation, which is, well, what we consider as good literature especially uh, in, uh, in America, right? We are basing this on European Anglo-Saxon version of what good literature is. So if you're judging the Twine games based on Anglo-Saxon or European standards of what good is, is that really fair? Okay, so if we can go next. Okay, so I kind of jump a little bit, but <laughs> judging Twine, a couple more things, okay? Maricopa says that people who critique Twine games tend to be of the same community. This is also a problem, okay? So again, if you have a small community, then your judgment is going to be limited to that community. Is that fair to other communities? Naomi Clark says that in the future, she asks, is there going to be a split between high Twine and low Twine, meaning are there high art version of Twine, and are there bad Twine? What are what are we talking about here, right? Now, what I have there, uh, and what it says there that I think, 
I'm, sh I'm not sure. <laughs> I get cut off a little bit. Twine games, I think, don't necessarily have to be for self-expression either because the majority of twine games is about memoir and self-expression. And she is saying that, no, it doesn't always have to be. So this particular game I asked, uh, gave us an example is called Choice Texas. And it's a wonderful game to, uh, based on research about the um, anti-abortion and also abortion rights that are happening in Texas. <laughs> it was released last year and it's completely based on research and you are going through this experience and learning what happened to these women as legislation gets passed. So if you have a chance in one of our resource pages I've included the link as well as the trailer for this game and it's definitely a, a twine game that you want to experience. Okay, So I think um, next and I think I'm done from that. But last note, and I'm sorry I, I forgot to mention this, from, from my end, when Naomi Campbell asked about what skills students must have, I have to say I assign twine as well in my classes and it is possible. It is possible to make twine uh, accessible if you teach students some narrative theory. So I am actively doing that as well. So that is an answer to her saying, is it accessible to students? Yes, if you teach them with other theories as well as with twine. So it's not just a tool that would teach itself. Okay. So sorry, Kay. <laughs> no, no, no problem at all. I think I think we're gonna even have to go back to some things. Um so now I'm gonna finish I'm gonna finish up and then we're gonna go back and see if anybody wants to make comments or anything like that. Okay. So what I'm gonna talk about is games for change and the effect of domain. And and really the reason why I'm talking about this is as I was watching the live stream for Games for Change, and I did get to, to watch some of the portions, and I was very happy to do that. Um, especially what the game that Chris did called, ne called you know, Never Alone. They had two people up there, one an experienced player and one person who was an experienced gamer but just playing the game for the first time. They were up there and they were describing, well, this experience, I'm not sure how you say it, and I'm, but it kind of affects you. And, and then I'm like, oh, well, it, it's the effective domain. <laughs> and and that it wasn't something else that and the thing about it is well the twine um well the twine session definitely had educators in there the other set the other se session especially the the playing session the let's basically the let's play session didn't have educators there so it was a very different dialogue so I guess what I'm answering to is if you go back and you watch. <laughs> What was shown at Games for Change? I really, I really think that that maybe if you have this framework, this might help. But everything that I tell you at the end of this all, I'm going to tell you why you shouldn't listen to it at all. So if you if you go to the next slide, and and it'll make sense when I get to there. Um, but basically, and this is from the 1950s. And sorry, I'm an educator. I go back. I look at educational theory. I I, I can't help myself. So this is my frame. So. There's three domains of learning, and there's cognitive, there's effective, and the, <laughs> the psychomotor. Now, cognitive, we hear all the time. We as educators, oh my god, every time we do curriculum, every time we're doing learning objectives, every time we need something, and, and for me, it's at the community college, every time that the state community college will approve something, it only gets approved if you take those verbs from Bloom's taxonomy and you pull them out of that cognitive, <laughs> the cognitive, and you use those verbs, and then you can go ahead and do that. Now, rarely, very rarely is the effective domain discussed, and then the psychomotor, which a lot of gamers will know that this is where you build up your skills, and this is your die and do over, that, that part doesn't even get discussed. Okay? <laughs> so, go ahead and go to the next slide. So, the whole thing for Games for Change, I just kept going, you know, effective domain. It's everything there. And this is from David Craftwall, and while we say Bloom's taxonomy, I mean, the thing of it is, Bloom wasn't the only one who's writing all these things. So this was the guy. While Bloom focused more on the cognitive, this is the guy. This is the guy who who focused more on the effective. And you can see there. And I know there's a lot of words, but you know, here is what the effective domain. It's behavior. It's attitudes of awareness, interest, intention, 
concern, responsibility, your ability to listen, and respond in interactions with others. So, you know, every time that you hear about digital citizenship, guess what? <laughs> it's coming from there. Okay? It's coming. <laughs> It's coming from it's coming from there, and these are all the things that we're saying that we we want our students to do, okay? And 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 to give you an example of this, I'm gonna I'm going to screen share something I have, and this is on the Games for Change site. And um, the Games for Change, you know, they're in their eleventh year now. They've been doing this for eleven years, so this is one of the older ones. But I think everybody I know who does game-based learning and and when I say game-based learning it's not like they picked it up last year or the year before and they still get gamification and game-based learning confused but everybody I know who's been doing it for a while has taken this has taken this game into their class one way or another and it's called Doffer is Dying I know Chris has, I know Sherry has I, I have other friends um, who have I've worked with Sherry Emerson who's done it in her anthropology class and if you just look at this and I'm just gonna just pick some points web-based viral video designed to raise awareness of the genocide taking place in Doffer so raising awareness empowering college students to help stop the crisis okay the content and the creative are woven together it helps make activism intuitive I'm not sure if I agree with that but look here's the thing they at the end of this it gives action items in the game so that users can send an automated note to President Bush, it was when we had President Bush, to support the people of Doffer or petition Congress to pass legislation that aids Doffer's refugees and by doing so increases the overall health of the camp. Okay, this is the difference. This is a, isn't this is it, your students looking at articles about Duffer, evaluating them for credibility, synthesizing these, and then writing them in an essay. This is straight going, this is straight going back to interest, attention, concern, responsibility, and taking action. And this is what Games for Change is about. It's this kind of social impact. And if you can go to the next slide, that would be great. Okay, and so so when it comes to the effective domain, uh, it, it has levels, just like Blooms does. And if anybody knows the first level in Blooms, <laughs> and I have to say, anybody who's written curricula or learning objective starts knowing these by heart. But but this is the other one. Yes, Leanne answered knowledge, remembering. Can you can you can you give me facts back? To okay it's different here over here on the effective side it's receiving so it's attention to new it's attention to new information okay then the next one is responding this is actively participating or interacting with the, the new information so you're discussing you're presenting you're reading you're selecting you're telling things like that the next one is valuing. So this is seeing the worth. So this is, um, excuse me, justifying or differentiating or selecting or sharing. Then the next one is organization, fitting in the new information into a, a existing schema and deciding how the new information makes sense for you. Okay. And then the last one is characterization. This is taking the new information in, exhibiting new behavior and attitudes or beliefs. So this is what the effective domain is. And this is a lot, I think when, it, when they were talking about Twine and Twine being accessible and bringing, that Twine allowed people to, to write and express themselves. And while a Twine is open, and, while Twine is open and with a, a little bit of help, most people can adjust and start doing a game development with it. That's that's what I think they, they mean about accessible. But, but we can talk about that if we want to more. But what it is, is having games that can go ahead and affect. And, and Sherry just asked, are we suggesting that we use her bloom? I, yeah, well, I, well, I quite honestly, I am suggesting yes. <laughs> 
and, and what I'm saying is take Bloom, take, you know, <laughs> take Strathwell, and, and also take the psychomotor. I mean, the thing of it is, die and do over. You know, that try and try again and and go back and look at it and see if it works and what pattern, that's from the psychomotor domain. You know, where you don't see that in blooms. You see synthesizing in blooms. You see, oh, let's evaluate this in blooms. You don't say, let's try this and let's try this one again. And let's you don't see it. So so yeah, I, I think we should usurp. Okay. So now I've told you about the effective domain, and when I was listening to everything here, I just I just kept thinking, oh, okay, there is a place to put it. There is a way to talk about it. You know, I can write learning objectives with this. Yeah, and Sherry just wrote in the chat. It's like the freaking matrix. Yeah, it is. <laughs> in so many different ways. Double entendre there, Sherry. But um, the thing of it is, you know, my thoughts aren't new. I have no new thoughts. Okay, but anyway, at Games for Change last year, a bunch, of, a bunch of the intellectuals, and and I say that with you know all respect, started to go. Wait a second, this social impact. We're not all talking about it the same way, and we're not using the same vocabulary, and we're not talking to each other, and it's getting splintered, and it's getting fragmented. So what they did over the last year is they came up with this report. It's called Impact with Games, a fragmented, a fragmented field. Okay, and um, the thing of it is, this report, and it's not a big read, so you can go in and look at it. It just comes out with five things for impact, so it's really easy to go in, and, <laughs> and um, you can go in there and take a look at it, and there's no problem with that. Um, the thing of it is, what they came out with, and I'm quoting this, is recognizing the growing breadth of games and seeking new coherence in describing their impact. That these games for change, that if we're going to discuss how they're making an impact, and, and I would say past the effective domain, even to the psychomotor, and, and just because I've had lots of discussions with Marie, I know how with the big MMOs that she that she talks about how her son is learning how to negotiate in these. And and you know, Games for Change wasn't even talking about that. Wasn't even talking about the big collaborative stuff that comes out of it. So I, I still see area for there, but the breadth of games and seeking new coherence in describing their impact. And I think a lot of us that play MMOs could look at describing their impact where it doesn't fit into anything in this fragmentation report, nor anything in either, nor in anything in either domains. Now they're also suggesting um, a more. It should only be one inclusive, but obviously that made such an impact for me. I typed inclusive twice. Inclusive typology of how games affect social issues. Now, when you're playing a game, how does it, you know? How does this playing of a game affect a certain social issue? Like Doffer is dying, they suggested that you write a letter to con Congress. I will tell you that when our students at our community college played that game, they didn't necessarily write to Congress, um, but they started thinking about what's it like in a refugee camp. Because Doffer is dying, you can't win in that game. There's another game for change out there called ICE. Um, which is a lot like Papers, Please that came out this year. I think Papers, Please came out this year or last year, where you can't win the game. And what you're and really, to me, those games are trying to teach you the futility of it all. Because I know when Chris taught it for his students, his students kept going, why can't I win this game? Why can't I fight back? Why don't, and I mean, that led to a lot of discussions and a lot of feelings, I would say, of, of taking it out of, of just a game and going, you can't do that because this is based off something real and in that real life, you know, the 12 year old kid, the 8 year old kid that's playing, that you're playing as a character can't fight back. So, the other thing is, as far as impact, this um, fragmentation report is really looking at what's the definition of impact. 
to have an effect, an influence, to make a certain, make a difference on an individual or community level or even affect society. Okay? Now, when it comes to us in school, you know, we are stuck on those on those assessment scores. We're not looking at this at mu so much. We're not looking at how it can help with wicked problems, you know, and you know, and and if I was to quote Barbara, you know, Barbara Truman, it would be like what's chaotic out there, what you can do about that. Okay. So, this is what this fragmentation report is looking at. So this fragmentation report has this call for ideas, and the draft is open for comments. I made a Google, Google Doc. Anybody from the metagame or ISTE who wants to put comments in there will submit it as the Games and Sim Network, or you can go and you can just submit it, or you can just go and you can just submit this one yourself. That's that's perfectly fine, also. So. I guess with for the effective domain, what I wanted to say is when you're looking at games, it might not just be about what you're used to assessing the students on. I mean, a student playing a game besides <laughs> you know, besides going ahead and 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 you know, just playing it till its end, you know, what impact does it have on the student? outside of whatever kind of normal testing ha is happening and I, I don't even I don't even know if I want to get into the psycho into the psychomotor portion of it but there 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 is a lot that games can teach us and so we're going to be wrapping this up and if you'll continue on so basically, um, these are the claims that the study made. I'm not going to talk about them much, but I'm just throwing them out there for you. Impact is too narrowly defined. You know, that some of the games when they're assessing things, they aren't going, you know, they aren't going, even if it's digital citizenship, they're not going past, can the students state the rules? Um, key terms are politicized, and Sherry was bringing this up, and Marie was bringing this up. You know, what is a game? And John was bringing it up too. Oh, you know, some people might think, you know, Home Again is not a game because it doesn't fit this. <laughs> and and the other thing is assessment, and and I will tell you, there's a couple of us on this panel who love assessment. But assessment is a dirty word for a lot of people. Uh, there are some people, game designers included, if you say assessment to them, they are not happy about it. So these are two words that, that are still out there. And there's others that, that people are just, you know, are just getting polarized if they're, if they're mentioned. Um, evaluation methods are inflexible. And this goes back to, you know, kind of a, creating an assessment just for that game or the game around an assessment rather, rather than any of the other features. And then um, applicant, applicants, um, and this, they're talking about grants, and these are academics, so applicants are confused by calls for funding and awards that, that, that seriously some of the RFPs getting out there are going, we want a game for change, we want a game for impact, and then if you read what they want, it's totally different than, than what other people have a view of. And then last but not least, typologies are deep but not connected. Like um, how we did what is a good game, that was really based on, based, I'm sorry, based on us um, because we're educators. So it was really coming out of Katie Salins and Eric Zimmerman's discussions of what, you know, what is a good game plus Jim G. And then, you know, if you look at another field, they're coming out with their own typology about it and their own research and their own decisions. And, and their point was that there were silos that were deep but, but not, you know, not connecting. And the report, if you take a look at it, I believe they, and right here, but anyway, <laughs> I believe they, they interviewed, they did 45 interviews, they did grounded theory, so, they, so grounded theory is, you know, they keep asking questions until a topic gets saturated, and then, and then they go and code it and pull out the key points. So that's what they did for this. So I think this report, I'm going to use, I'm going to use the word accessible. I think this report is very accessible for people. That you look at the five impacts, think about it, and if you've been doing game-based learning for a while, you're going to have some opinions. 
Now, like I said, you can put it on the Google Doc, or I have the website listed there also, and you can just go there and you can put anonymous com comments. So, that's basically, that's basically all I have to kind of end this up. And so, if here's the thing. This was our Metagame Book Club discussion. And <laughs> I was going to say, I was going to open it up to any other panelists who wants to say things. And Leanne's been typing in comments a lot. And I think we might want to get something from her. And if Leanne doesn't want to talk, we can end it. <laughs> that works too. And we're, and we're thinking, and we're thinking we might have some people who are kind of muted. And Leanne, we can hear you, possibly. Oh, oh no! <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so Leanne, we can't hear you. And if she doesn't feel like talking. I can quite say that uh, some of the things that she's been quoting is the problem of working in technology is moving so fast and its targets keep changing and moving. That that's a that that's a consideration. Um, some of the other things that she said: failure to address games, television, media, and schools is a denial of an entire body of literature. And we didn't see much attention given that to them in the Common Core standards. And <laughs> and she was saying that us looking that uh, us looking at the domains was pretty much the antithesis of gaming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love that comment. Hey. Yeah, hey, I, you know, I I think this is a really exciting conversation, and I think everybody's presentation gives us all so much to think about. Um, I, I really go back to what John was saying about his students being resistant to this uh, to agree or not embracing it or not thinking games yeah. can be in school and way back there and Sherry agreed with me that it's those top students that are most resistant to change and I think that that's some of what we're facing with just conceptualizing this idea that this whole body of literature, video games, videos, YouTube, um, uh, Facebook, yeah, the, the whole digital world isn't being given a place in the body of literature that's being considered academically sanctioned. Mm -hmm. And I, I just... I think we're missing a big chunk of the lives that the 21st century citizen is going to have to live in. And this whole group, except for maybe Sherry, knows that uh, I have a, a daughter who is working in a tech company, and I, her experience with what's expected of tech workers is dramatically different from what she was prepared for in school. And I just I think that it's not a question of if we should be doing this. I just think we have to. My other big thought was I just have a lot of trouble with Robert Ebert not Roger Ebert not thinking that games are art. And I looked at the Never Alone and think how could you possibly not see that as art? And I think Sherry did some research on what um, Sherry. You've looked up what his thought pattern was or or something like that before didn't you yeah um particular really he his concerns and let me see what did i say earlier huh oh that was, that was brilliant <laughs> that was brilliant yeah. absolutely brilliant it's the, <laughs> he said it was about the inter that you don't yeah, interact with art the same way you do with games was it something yeah. like that this has to do, it, this, this all culminates with this idea that art is expression of, of meaning, okay? And the idea that an artist is the author, the authority for oh, expressing okay. this art. Therefore, when you can interact with it, the, the viewer has turned that art into their own. Therefore, that is not art. That becomes a plaything. So for him, there is this, this uneasy tension where he can't, 
get past this idea of co-creation of art. Oh, okay. <laughs> he, still, he wants to give respect, and I understand his argument. I understand he wants to give respect back to the artiste, you know, mm -hmm. making making it, and you just view it. And art is for viewing, right? It's not for you to interact with. So once you interact with it, then then somehow it takes away from the authority of the artist, and you mutate the meaning from what the artist originally said. But again, you know, Leanne already mentioned this with the reader response theory. You know, there's also interpretation, <laughs> right? From from the viewer's end, so it's it's his personal argument. I understand his perspective on that. Um, I don't agree with it. <laughs> I I would also the the other interesting thing, and and there's a there's a chat for speakers that happens, so you can send little messages, and so that's what that's what we're referring to. Um, but. Also, when Jonathan was talking about how he was watching his brother play the video games and he was experiencing that way, that, um, you made a remark about people who watch Let's Plays. Oh, yes. Um, what I was saying there is I've always figured, because I am obsessed with narratives, I love reading books, and I have a particular interest in watching Let's Plays. I consume them almost every day just to get <laughs> just to relax. <laughs> but when I watch, there's different kind of enjoyment versus me playing it than than watching it. Because watching I find interaction sometimes is distraction because I'm you know, interaction requires lots of cognitive powers. It requires your brain constantly functioning to work with complex, right? Complex processes. Yeah. So if I say, I don't want to work my brain, <laughs> I want to read the story, I want to consume it to satisfy my, you know, effective domain. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> Therefore, I, I want to watch Let's Play. So there are different part of your brain that's being activated here, but the idea is that Let's Play is for enjoyment and is for, for really just consuming the narrative and thinking about that narrative, right? So um, I think that's what I was saying there. <laughs> Oh yeah, and and uh, you see, this panel has a number of raiders, and they totally get it's different, and and just be just because we are raiders, we do record our raids, and we go back and watch them, psychomotor domain, to get better at them, and we know that there's a difference between when when you're in it and you are focused and you're tunneling versus when you can when you can sit back and watch them, mm -hmm. and. I, and I mean, I, I think I would say that this group, that Fat Boss, is among the favorite <laughs> tutorials or let's plays that 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 all of us like like to watch. And and part of it is because it's entertaining. You know, it's very interesting too. Uh, this is this is kind of a side comment, but it's connected. And I just remembered this, which is in linguistics. You know, if you go through linguistics, so you know that the writing process and the reading process are separate. Processes. I know Leanne knows this, but let me give you an example. When when <laughs> someone is learning, for example, Chinese characters, okay, they if they read if they learn to read and write it, and they stop writing Chinese characters for a while, they can still look at Chinese character and recognize what that character is. But if you ask them to write that character out, they're unable to write it. There are two different processes going on here, right? But you need both. So the writing, if you think of writing, it's interaction. And we know through research that when you're using your pen and you're actually writing, it helps you with your memory. So interaction is important, but there are different processes happening here. And we can't really deny one or the other. So this whole discussion with is that a game or is that not a game, it's about the degree of interaction you have with it. But I also want to mention another thing I'm thinking about, right, which is the... <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. No, so, it's okay, go. We talked about fun, and I think we, uh, in our last session, uh, we talked about yeah, what exactly is fun. And fun <laughs> is defined in the sense, uh, uh, Rafe Coaster talked about this too, right, where fun is when something is complex and it's hard to, to, to conquer. But when it's too hard, people have rage quit. And yeah, if it's yeah. too easy, it's not fun. Mm -hmm. So. When you say that games are not good for learning because it's not serious enough, what the heck are we talking about here? If you say learning has to go through a difficult process, there are plenty of games which you have to use lots of cognitive uh, uh, skills to actually conquer. Those are the games that are fun for our students. So why are we not assigning fun games rather than <laughs> process 
yeah. learning games. But I'm, oh, okay, I'll stop there. <laughs> no, that's okay. I, I, I think somebody else might want to jump on my keep now, even. <laughs> um, <laughs> so one of the <clears throat> one of the keynotes uh, at at the uh, Games for Learning Summit was um, Richard Collada, and he said a thing that we all agree with, but that we all lose sight of. He said we don't need to we don't need gaming in order to make learning fun. Learning is fun. But what we need to do is stop making it be unfun, right? We need to stop doing these things to learning, which is one of the most enjoyable activities in, you know, in, in, in human existence, and take that and turn it into something that looks and feels like, like, like drudgery. Um, I also wanted to comment on what Leanne said earlier about the expectations in the workforce. Um, and my perspective on that comes at, from somebody who's been in uh, executive leadership, technology leadership for decades. And it is shocking to me how unprepared people are when they come out of school to be effective in these work environments. And it's not that they don't have their basic skills. It's not that they don't know how to code or that they don't know how to build an architecture or they, I mean, that they don't know their basic skills. They do know those. But what they don't know is how to take what they know and apply it in a collaborative environment. And I, would, I have to say that, in, that one of the things that makes games fun and hard and interesting is the fact that um, is how we play so many of them in these multiplayer environments and that a lot of the uh, complexity that arises is the genuine and honest complexity of human interaction and that having the ability to be exposed to that uh, earlier in your life than um, one normally would, right? If you go through your career, you're 10 years into your career before you start having to deal with some of the things that a raid leader in World of Warcraft has to deal with. And so I, I feel as though that these environments, by their mere existence, by playing them for fun and hard and complexity, that there is the opportunity, not that everybody will take that opportunity, but there is the opportunity to gain the kinds of skills that are real and meaningful in, in, in the workplace. And I think with that, we're going to end it. And, and so this was kind of our overview of Games for Change. Um, for the Metagame Book Club, <laughs> I can tell you we do have, um, we'll have everything up in the Google community, we'll tweet it out, but I guess the basic thing we're trying to do here is, look, there's this great resource, there's this annual conference, there is this great nonprofit organization out there that looks at, at games that, you know, work on the effective domain. The, and the games are out there, they're being written up, um, use them for your classes. Go ahead, play some. I know that what Chris did was Chris basically took a list of them and and gave them to his students, and they only had to choose one. And he had them do the reviews, and and then you know he knew what what to keep, what not to keep. And I mean he played them himself, but he also sent them out to the students. So there's a lot of different ways you can think about using these. So go there as a resource. And, and the other thing, if you're in the Metagame Book Club, just post in the Metagame Book Club. Hey, I'm trying to come up with this idea of how to use this game. Trust me, you have a lot of opinionated educators in the <laughs> book club <laughs> who, who will tell you exactly what to do, whether it works for you or not. Okay? So I just want to thank everybody once again. <laughs> And um, we'll be seeing you. We'll be back um, in July with Ready Player One. And we'll put more of that up on the site. So thank you guys very much. Bye. <laughs>